Just imagine that we could watch the evolution of plants which began about three and a half billion years ago in time lapse. Millions of years would shrink into a few minutes and we could even watch the processes occurring. Impossible? Professor Ralph Bock aims to do just that, to make evolution happen in his laboratory and to study it. One of the main questions of evolutionary science which fascinates us is how a primitive cell could develop into the diversity of life we know today. And we wondered whether we could recreate the main steps in this process in the laboratory, in time-lapse, so to speak, so that we could study the mechanisms on which they are based. To do so, Ralph Bock needs to compress millions of years of development into just a few weeks. His test objects are tobacco plants in the greenhouse of the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Plant Physiology in Golm. He wants to use them to reconstruct how the primordial cell was formed billions of years ago, the starting point for higher forms of life on Earth. The scientists are interested in the cell organelles, especially the chloroplasts. The endosymbiotic theory claims things began with protozoa, which absorbed other simple single-cell organisms' bacteria. That way they could make use of their ability to generate energy. And then these protobacteria developed into mitochondria, the cell's power plants. Millions of years later, single-cell organisms, this time cyanobacteria, were also swallowed up. They can absorb energy from sunlight, a huge advantage. During the course of evolution, they too lost their independence and became organelles within plant cells known as chloroplasts. A sign of their bacterial origins, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA, which differs from that in the cell nucleus. But the scientists also found the genes of bacteria within the nuclear genome. How did they get there? The theory is that they could have migrated from the chloroplasts to the nucleus, but so far no one has been able to watch this happen. Ralph Bock and his colleagues in the laboratory team have proved this migration. They made use of the fact that the genes in the nucleus and the genes in the chloroplasts have different properties. He will use these zip fasteners to explain the differences. Here, the chloroplast gene is green and the nuclear gene is blue. A gene needs a specific starting point and a specific end in order to be read correctly and translated into messenger RNA. This zip here represents a nuclear gene. In nuclear genes, the starting and ending points are quite different from those of chloroplast genes. The enzyme that translates DNA into RNA can recognize the starting point of a chloroplast gene in the chloroplast and use it to synthesize messenger RNA. That same enzyme cannot decipher the starting point of a nuclear gene. So the nuclear gene in the chloroplast cannot be read. We made use of this fact for our experiment and built a nuclear gene of this type into the chloroplast genome. The scientists have created a new gene which is resistant to a plant toxin. But it can only protect the plant if it is built into the nuclear genome. To prove the genetic migration, the researchers have now introduced this gene into the chloroplasts. To do so, they attach the gene to microscopic particles and load it into a gene gun that shoots the particle at high pressure onto the leaf of the tobacco plant. The gene gun is loaded, fire! The ammunition is a nuclear gene for toxin resistance shown here in blue. It will only be activated in the nucleus because it does not receive the right starting signal in the chloroplast. The enzyme, the slider, cannot read the gene. If these cells come into contact with the plant toxin, they will die. The only cells to survive are those in which the gene has migrated from the chloroplast into the cell nucleus. The scientists want to prove this by placing treated pieces of leaf onto a toxic culture medium. Six weeks later, we should be able to see, have some cells survived? Most have died, but not all. Look, here is a tiny shoot. 
some cells have survived the toxin, and there is only one explanation for that. The gene must have migrated from the chloroplast into the cell nucleus. Since it is a nuclear gene, it can only become active there. The nuclear enzyme, the RNA polymerase, the blue slider, recognizes its starting point, and the gene can be translated into the correct protein. So the cell now has a new property. It is immune to the toxin. That is why a new shoot can grow. For the first time, it has been possible to prove a gene transfer of this kind in the laboratory. What really surprised us was the incredibly high frequency with which the chloroplast gene still migrate across into the nuclear genome. We could detect this transfer in one out of five million cells. If we look at a tobacco leaf like this one, it has over a hundred million cells. That means that here we have almost a hundred different events in which a chloroplast gene has sprung over into the nuclear genome within a single cell. The question remains as to how the migrated genes could find the correct starting sequence during the course of evolution. After all, they are different from chloroplast genes. We found out in further experiments that a transferred chloroplast gene like this one can become functional in the cell nucleus simply by capturing a suitable starting sequence from the nuclear genome. We can see this here. Now the enzyme in the nucleus, which translates DNA into RNA, can attach itself to this starting point and translate our transferred chloroplast gene into RNA. Over the course of time, the chloroplasts transferred a large percentage of their genes to the cell nucleus, a procedure which may possibly not yet be complete. For Ralph Bock, one thing is clear. Evolution will continue even if it is not as fast as in his laboratory.